Why don't we stand? I want to preach. I want to draw your attention to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 23. And church, I just want to tell you something, that I'm going to preach a sermon today entitled, Tell Satan Where to Go and Help Him Get There. Tell Satan where to go and help him get there. Atypical of what I usually do, but I, I, I really felt compelled, moved of the Spirit uh, to preach this. But anytime you want to com uh, confront the powers of darkness, pardon the cliche, but all hell breaks loose. All hell breaks loose. And I've been generally healthy. But yesterday I was worn out, tired. I couldn't get enough. I, I just didn't feel well. This morning I got up at 6 o'clock. At 3 o'clock in the morning I was awake. Because the enemy knew, and it wasn't for any reason. I just woke up with, you know, stuff going on. And for, for no reason that I can logically explain. Because I, I believe the enemy knew that I was going to call him out today. Amen. And I came in this morning. I told the church. And I feel free. I'm ready to, I'm ready to battle. I'm ready to battle. And, and before we read the text, oftentimes in our American context, we sometimes belittle the impact of powers of darkness. Because we're too logical and rational, we want to be able to understand scientifically what is going on. So we call things paranormal. You've seen all those paranormal things on TV, right? And we don't call them what they are. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against powers and principalities in the air. So let me, some of you know this, but some of you are too intellectualized. Let me just deflate and neutralize your intellectual uh, 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 pragmatism and tell you that there is a world out there of powers of darkness that move and cannot be explained. And that's what I want to confront today. Go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. I want to park ourselves on verse 23. But look at this, what went on with Peter. And this is, by the way, a transitional time in the history of the church. I'll, I'll explain that when I have you seated. That way you won't have to be standing too long. Uh, uh, Matthew 16, verse 21, the Gospel of Matthew. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day of day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He says, never, Lord, he said, this, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, <laughs> for you are a stumbling block to me. Note the text. He wasn't referring to Peter. He called that out to what? You shouldn't be fighting against people. You should be fighting against the enemy. You shouldn't be fighting against your children, your husband, your wife, your, your, your boss, your church. Fight against the enemy. He turns to me and says, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have a mind of the things of God, but the things of men. Let the Lord have blessing to the word. You may be seated. And again, we live in a context and in a world that oftentimes when you talk about spirituality, when you talk about the powers of good and evil, people in the movie industry will make tons of money up on that thing. And we think that it's all fantasy. We think that it's not real. But I'm here to tell you and to reawaken your, your mind that there's uh, uh, many things in our life journey that we can explain and that we can understand logically. But then there are events and things that happen in our journey or perhaps that have happened in the past that we cannot really explain logically, but nonetheless we cannot deny the reality of those occurrences. Some of us have grown up in environments and situations where there, were, there was witchcraft and there were seances and there was uh, spiritual activity, if you will. And now we're all uh, 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 edumacated and we're all uh, sophisticated and we're all moved on. And we, don't th and we think if we don't think and dwell on those things, they really didn't exist. But I'm here to tell you that there is a real world out there of powers of darkness. Powers that are trying to keep you ill. Powers that are trying to destroy your home life. Powers that are trying to also destroy your future and the plans that you have moving ahead. Come on, there are many of you here that have gone to the doctor and the doctor has done all the tests that science can bring out and the doctor says, I don't know what is going on with you. And you still feel the pain, you still feel the aches, you still feel the things battling inside of you, but scientifically it, it cannot be proven, uh, it, it cannot be discovered, so a remedy cannot come. I'm here to tell you that don't discount the very fact that the enemy is at work to try and make you lose your mind. To try and make you lose. You ever had a, a fight with your spouse or with your children or with your boss? And after you spend 15 minutes arguing, you pull back and you say, now what were we fighting about? You don't even know what it was that drew you to that discord or that uh, moment of discontent. 
I'm here to tell you that the enemy comes in in a, in a way that you may not even realize in a very subtle way. You ever uh, been in, a, in, the, in the job, in the workforce, and you're at the, the factory or at the office, and things are maneuvering in such a way that there seems to be like the whole world is against you. You can't pinpoint it. And, and, and gossip rises up and false accusations rise up, and you can't even find the source of where those comments are coming from. I'm here to submit to you that the devil is alive and well and Satan. And I intentionally, and some of my notes you'll see up there, I intentionally misspell the name of Satan in lowercase because he doesn't deserve to have his name spelled right. So don't think it's a typo. No, all my notes and what you'll see up there, lowercase. He deserves to be in the lowercase. Hallelujah. God deserves to be in the higher case. He deserves to be in the lowercase. But there's things that are moving around. In our family, in our workplace, our finances, you do everything that you can to get yourself out of those situations. And somehow, some way, there are streams and influences and powers that are moving in there that don't let you progress moving forward. For some of you like myself that come from, from a Latino or Caribbean or, or, or even African and other cultures, you will find that for us in our cultural upbringing, spiritual battles was, were, were not unusual. Uh, especially me, I grew up, I was born in Guayama, which is known in Puerto Rico as the, the center of witchcraft. So I know in my family tree, there must have been a lot of witches and warlocks and demonic oppression and going on. And so for us to think that that isn't there or that isn't so, we're only fooling ourselves. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in the air. You ever had someone ever lift up an accusation against you and everyone believed it? Meanwhile, you, weren't, you didn't do it, you weren't there, you weren't involved in that, but people act like if it was. I grew up in the Lower East Side, so when I was going to the school over here, now it's not no longer there, uh, on Forsyth Street, it used to be PS64, Junior High School 64, I was going there, hanging out with some guys, this is in the, in the seventh grade, one of the guys did something crazy, which I won't repeat here. Because I knew him, all of a sudden I was called into the principal's office. And I've shared this part with you. I was suspended for something I never did. So I was labeled because I was, someone said that I was there. When in reality, I was never even there when they did that. Until this day, although my mom is gone, I can remember her crying uh, in the vice principal's office because he, I was being falsely accused of something that I told him, Mom, I never did. That ever happened to you? You ever falsely accused? You ever had somebody lift up a, a, a story about you that wasn't really real? And you think, oh no, is that people are evil? You, you need to get the message of, of Wednesday's teaching. Because in Jesus' lineage, not only were there wonderful people and great people, but there were people in his lineage that were really outright evil. And in our journey, we're going to find people that are inclined toward evil, that are inclined toward negativity, that are inclined toward destroying and not building. And so today, that's what I want to do. Tell Satan where to go in your life and help him get there. Now, God is so powerful. We're just saying it. He's awesome. That he has the power to be able to neutralize, destroy, and put Satan away forever. But I'm here to tell you that you and I, when we meet certain conditions, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, we also have the authority to be able to neutralize the influences of the power of evil, to break that stronghold and live a fruitful life, a life of purpose that God has in store for us. And this story is powerful because Matthew opens up and he starts telling us, here is, in a way, you think about it, Peter was trying to like help Jesus out, if you will. And he says, oh no, those things are not going to happen to you. And the Lord turns around, and I already mentioned it, but I just want to repeat it because it's one of my points in my, in my sermon today. He turns around and does not attack Peter. Mom, you're attacking the wrong person. Dad, you're attacking the wrong person. We have to realize that the enemy thinks he's a lion. The Bible says that he goes around, he thinks he's a lion, looking to whom he devour. There's only one lion, and that's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and that's Christ Jesus. The enemy is deceptive. He, he, he spins things in our lives that people will be convinced of something that we are not. And so here the Lord turns around and he tells Peter, he, he tells Satan, the presence of the, the powers of darkness, get thee behind me because you don't understand what's going on. So I, I, want, to, I want to highlight two parts of the sermon. The first part, I want to highlight what you and I need to understand when the enemy comes in. How can you be used of God to tell Satan where to go? And then the second part is, how do we help them get that? Number one, you have to realize, number one, James 4, 7 says that submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the, the, the first important element that I want you to park on is the one that's going to move is him, not you. You need to hold your ground. You need to, especially if you're living right now, if you're not living right, if you're not living a, a, a life of integrity, if you're not living a life that's pleasing unto God, then I, I can't help you. 
But if you're living right, the Bible tells us that he's the one that has to move. Note the text. Submit yourself. Submit in the New Testament is a military term that actually means to voluntarily place yourself under the authority of someone else. You don't have to, but you do it voluntarily. It's a military term. So he says, submit yourselves. And su yourself in the original language is actually written in the singular. So I cannot submit for you. I need to submit myself individually in the singular. In the singular. You following me? And I have to voluntarily place myself under the authority of someone else. When I do that to God, note that I love this. Not religion, not philosophy, not the, the, the intellectual goings of men and, and humanity, but rather submit ourselves to God. And let me stop there again. It is your experience, your level of knowledge and discovery of God that you have to submit yourself to. There's not an expectation that you have to be the scholar in order to be able to understand all the profound teachings and innuendos and imponderables of Scripture in order for you to submit yourself in what God has revealed of himself into your life, into that level of knowledge, you need to submit yourself. That's why a child can do it. That's why a senior can do it. That's why someone that's gone to school can do it. That's why someone that can't read or write can do it. Based on your experience of your level of revelation of God, submit yourself. And then he says resist. And I like that word resist because in the middle it really means that there's no push. I'm going to give you pushback. In other words, I'm here to stay. See, when, 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 and I learned this through the, the dog whisperer. The dog whisperer has taught me a lot about the Bible. <laughs> Cesar Millan, first of all, is the aura of what you carry. Now, I don't have a, I don't have a dog, and I'm not anti-dog, but we've never had a dog except when we were growing up, right? So when you walk into a presence of, of an animal, you have to be assured. You've got to emanate this confidence. And, I, and I've actually applied it in my life when I'm walking and all these pit bulls are all over the place. Since I, since I was watching Cesar Millan, no pit bulls don't bother, don't bother me anymore. Why? Because I walk around like I'm the master pit bull. <laughs> Confident. You following me? Right? And what happens? The moment you back down, like one of the things I, we, when we went to Africa in 2006, one of the stories that Dr. Wins told us, Pastor Ian and I went over there to teach. We were there for, you know, almost three weeks. And when we were there, Pastor Wins told us, if an animal of prey, uh, you, you confront an animal of prey, what you do is you have to make it seem like you're bigger than they are. And so, and he says, never run. Because when you run, that's going to trigger their instinct to kill you because now you're prey. So you stand up and he says he actually, now I've never done that with lions, tigers, and bears or mine. <laughs> but sometimes New York City is not too far from the jungles of, uh, hallelujah. Sometimes people you meet in our families and in our journey and sometimes even in the church are not too far from lions, tigers, and bears or mine. But the point is here in resist, the way it's taught in the New Testament, that means I'm not going to back down. You may kill me where I'm standing, but I'm going to stay standing. I'm not going to take a step back. I'm going to stand firmly in what I know right now. Note the text. He, said, he says here, then resist the devil and who will flee? He will flee. Resist. Stand your ground. You don't need to back down. I told you the story on Wednesday about this gentleman that was six foot five. I told you the story. Get the tape because I told this on Wednesday. And I'm not going to back down. You know, you were challenging my family. I'm a little guy five foot eight and you're bigger than me. But I'm going to hold my ground. In the spiritual realm, church, we need to do the same thing. Amen. I really believe that. You need to. Yesterday, someone knocked on my door because every, every, there's a campaign going on, right? So everybody that I don't even know or not, I can't believe they got into our building to be able to. Like yesterday, I went to get the mail, and the stack of junk mail that I had, the flyers of people voting for everything, I mean, running for everything, well, I'm not exaggerating. It was probably a half-inch thick. I threw everything away. Amen? I did, because you, I know who I'm gonna, what I'm going to do already, so. Uh, right? Uh, uh, now, I don't know why I'm mentioning that. Oh, oh, standing your ground. This big guy in my building, right? When you stand your ground, he was, the, and I tell you the story, I'll just tell it very briefly. No matter if he's big, I knew that I was right. I'm not going to back down from him. And I was there looking up at him, and he's down there looking down at me. But I'm not going to let you talk to my granddaughter the way you just talked to her. Are you following me? <laughs> you and I need to stand our ground, church. It says resist. That means I might be, and, and standing your ground, watch this. You can stand your ground nervous. You can stand your ground afraid. Dr. Wentz took us, I told you, to Africa. We were there in a, and we were in the park. And one day he's a photographer. We're in the car. And in, you know, in those countries, you, the drive, I couldn't drive because the steering wheel's on the other side. 
So I'm sitting on this side, and when we turned the bend in Kruger National Park, which is a park that's huge, the size of the state of Massachusetts, we're going through Kruger Park, we were there like two days, and we turned, when we turned, there's this, I love elephants, it's my favorite animal. There's this huge male bull, huge. He must have been like, to me, it looked like five feet tall. He's there standing, an amazing, amazing specimen of God's creation. And I was overwhelmed. We were in this little Toyota, right? Then he keeps going, and then on the other side, now there's a mama. You never mess with a mama animal. In fact, you never mess with a mama human either. <laughs> and when we're going that way, Nelson, all of a sudden, this herd, a small herd of about five, there was definitely a matriarch, a mama, and then there were teenagers, and then there was this baby, and Dr. Wins wants to take the picture that we're on this side, on my side, because they drive on the wrong side. Right? I'm being very American now. They ride on the wrong side. We don't ride on the wrong side. On the left side. And so he said, I got to take this picture. And then the mama bear didn't, I mean, the mama lion, I mean, the mama <laughs> elephant didn't see Dr. Wins. Saw me. And so, <laughs> I've never been so scared. Like, I'm, I'm as, more scared than that riding the A train at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> she charges us. But what happened? Dr. Wynn stood his ground. Not me. <laughs> I was nervous in my seat, but when I, you let me drive. Right? But he got his picture. Oftentimes, we have to stand our ground even scared. Even though if in your mind you feel like you're going to be defeated. In fact, even if others are saying you're going to be defeated, you have to stand your ground. It says here, resist the enemy. Res resist the attacks of Satan over your, your journey and your situation. These powers of darkness that you cannot explain logically and rationally. It could be that the enemy is stirring that inside of you. And when you stand your ground, you're going to watch him flee. Note the text. So he moves, not me. I'm not going anywhere. I have a friend of mine that pastors a large church in Queens. He's an older man. He's, he's been pastoring about, probably about 40 years. And he told me, because I, I always like sticking with, with you know, men and women that have been in ministry a long time because you learn from them. And he's telling me, the reason I've been able to be so successful is because for the first eight years that I was pastoring, my priority was to prove to the devil that I wasn't going anywhere. He says, people were coming and going. We didn't have the finances. But I stood my ground. And I proved to the enemy that I wasn't going. After the eight years, the ministry, the ministry took off and people start coming in. Church, you need to watch him flee, not you. Stay, he moves, not you. Hallelujah. That's James 4, 7. Let me get another text. Matthew 18, 18. It says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I'm here to tell you that we need to command, don't suggest, command Satan. Amen? Command, have authority. Now, this is if you're living right. Command. In fact, I'm going to go as far as tell you, boss him around. He can't, if he's manifesting his, his influences in your marriage, command him to get out. If he's messing around with your health, doctors can't figure out what's going on, command him to get out. If he's messing with your children, your home, your finances, your job, your career, and you know you're in the right path, command him to get out. Command him. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosened. We have to, and that's the authority that the church has. Sometimes we don't realize the influence and the power that we have. To bind in heaven, you must be correct. You must be able to connect with heaven via spiritual disciplines. This is not just for everybody. I mean, if you're living a reckless life and a life that you know is way off what God wants you to live, I can't help you at this moment. But if you're striving to live right, you live right through spiritual disciplines. That's worship. That's Bible, getting into the Word. That's prayer. That's a, a worship. Amen. That's helping others. Spiritual disciplines. To strengthen yourself. Then you'll be able to be in a position, in a place where you can declare and decree for your life, family, and future. I want to talk about that in a moment because there are people that are declaring and decreeing when they're not in a position to declare and decree. You have to have refrigerator rights. Huh? You can't just walk in and name it and claim it and it's yours. You're living a reckless life. But when you're striving, we're never going to live a life of perfection. How many people still have stuff they're working on in their lives? Perfect. You're perfect candidates. Me too. Right? But you know you have those and you're working them in your journey uh, uh, unfolding of your life, your daily unfolding of your life. But you're aware of those. You have then a right to the blessing in the kingdom of the Lord, and you have a right to command Satan to move. Declaring decree is not for everyone, but if you're striving to live a life of spirituality, you can tell Satan where to go. You can tell him, command him to get out. Number three, 
Romans chapter 6, 16 verse 20, and this is Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes the following. He says, the God, and I love this verse. I'm going to explain it as quickly as I can and still out of the text. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And that's church. The, the major idea that I get out of this verse, not only he has to move, not me, not only command Satan, no, don't suggest, but number three, place Satan out of sight. Note the text, the original text. Jesus tells Satan, who was, uh, uh, w w after Peter's words, he says, get thee behind me, right? Out of sight. Here we find in this text that the inspired writer of the book of Romans says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't walk like this. I mean, unless I walk by somebody that was listening to Cesar Millan previously and went and walked their dog, right? I don't walk like this. Amen? Sometimes the last time we discover that our, our, the, the, the soles of our shoes are worn out is when we're praying and somebody says, you better get your, your shoes fixed. Right? You don't walk. And where is Satan going to be? Under your feet. Out of sight. The thing is, I put my head down. The thing is, oftentimes, those things that are out of sight make us feel good. And so we bring them back into our perspective. We need to take those things and call them as it is and place them out of sight. Behind, There's some things behind you, leave them there. There's some things that you drop, don't pick them up. There's some things that are marred under your feet, leave them there. Amen? We need to place Satan. And I like the text. It says, that who's going to place them there? A God is going to place them there. And where is he going to place them? God can place them under his own feet. God can place them under someone else's feet. But God places them under your feet. Sometimes we have to be careful, spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, that we not lift up our feet and, 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 and bring back to life things that God had already resolved and allowed to die in our journey. God will crush Satan, not you. He will place them under your feet, not you. And what we need to do is push down hard and keep him there. Keep Satan there. Place him out of sight. Get it out of your situation. And church, whatever we have hidden will all of a sudden be, will come out to light. We need to make sure that Satan is behind us, Satan is underneath us, and never before us. Number four, we need to separate the person from the persecutor. And note here that the Lord didn't say, Peter, get thee behind me. He said, Satan. And oftentimes we expend so much energy fighting against the wrong enemy. It is not your child. It is not your boss. It is not your spouse. It is not the person that you're in relationship with. It is not them. The enemy is out there stirring to make your life miserable. You need to call it what it is and fight against those powers. Now, church, as I draw to the second part of the sermon, how do we do that? Because it's a tall task. When we talk about exorcism and fighting the powers of the spiritual powers of darkness, right away we start thinking about calling, you know, Father so and so and priest so and so, and there's got to be some kind of ritual that we need to do. Um, Although there is a place historically in that, I really believe that you and I, as part of the priesthood of men, where every single one of us are qualified through the cross of Calvary to have a position of influence and authority, you have authority over your situation. And you can use biblical truths and apply them into your lives so that when the enemy comes, because he's going to come attacking, you have the authority to help him get where he's going to go, where he needs to go. Amen? Amen. If there is a spiritual manifestation in your home, and, and this happens, church, and I, I can't signal on anybody because we, we, we minister in this area confidentially here with the congregation. Things you cannot explain going on in the spiritual realm. Yes, call someone that might be more spiritual, but you need to get to a place where you're stronger spiritually so that you can combat those forces as well. But how do you do that? So let, me, let me answer that question. How do you help the enemy get to where he needs to go? How do you get Satan there? Number one, Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he suggest here? Think about such things. We heard a sermon here a few years ago. We got to get rid of that stinking thinking. And church, you know it's true. Don't say it, man. Don't, come, don't show that it's really you that I'm talking to right now. But there's stuff. In fact, take your right hand. Take your right hand. Place it on your forehead. Close your eyes. Repeat this prayer. Dear God, Dear God I, rebuke I rebuke all those thoughts, all those 
that sometimes come into my mind that want to destroy my future. Help me that my thoughts might be pure, might be noble. In Christ's name, amen. Oftentimes what we need to do is start praying those prayers over our own situations. Because we very quickly, when somebody says something about someone without even investigating, we right away believe it. Stinking thinking. When someone talks about someone or lifts up a lie or an exaggeration about an individual, right away we say, I knew that was coming before we even investigate. We need to slow down and start to purify our mind, even of ourselves. We have a test coming up. I know I'm going to fail it. We have a doctor's appointment. I know the doctor's going to find that I only have three months to live. We have whatever. Uh, so you like somebody. I'm not going to ask him or her because, you know, they have, or no is what everybody tells me. I'm not cute enough. I'm not handsome enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough money. Those things might be true. Can we rewind the tape? I want to re restate my statement. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, it went out, right? Uh, where was I? Oh, get it out of your mind. Right. Oftentimes, we disqualify ourselves before we even move, fo move forward on the purposes that we have in our lives. Oftentimes, we see ourselves already not getting the promotion. We see ourselves not qualified, not having the, the right resume to achieve that that is achievable for you. Are you following me? And we need to move. Now, you don't want to be cocky and think you can conquer everything. No, but, but there are things in your life that oftentimes, because of our stinking thinking, right? And we sometimes think that our kids will never make it. Get that, mind, get that thought process out of your mind. Or we think that it's hereditary. There was suicide in my family. There's suicide in this generation and the future. Get that stinking thinking out of your mind. There were a, a, a addiction. No one in my family ever went to college. And in, in my generation, pre, no, get that out of That's stinking thinking. You've got to be able to read, and we're going to get to this. You need to change your thinking. Get new, new levels of thinking in your mind. Get the enemy out of your mind. Because what happens when you have a seed of low self-esteem and you let it take a life unto its own, what happens is that the enemy will come in and he'll make a forest out of that little seed. So it is a thought that you want to be able, you should arrest, you should neutralize, you should identify, you should neutralize, and you should manage, because there's stuff in life that you will never be free from, but you have to manage in your life. But you need to make sure that that does not take hold and have your mind on things that are pure, lovely, right, noble, true, admirable, of excellent praise. Think about those things, church. And, and this requires discipline. This requires that you intentionally Steer your mind where it should be going. Because there's some people that very easily make, make your judgment of them very easily to go on the negative side. We have to work hard at bringing, and that's part, and I'll talk about this in a moment, that's part of having the mind of Christ, that you don't see people as your enemy. When I meet individuals, I don't see them as an enemy force against me. They will prove whether they are or not, right? But oftentimes we meet someone, or depending upon what enterprise you're in, uh, you might uh, disqualify the relationship that can be helpful later on or even mutually beneficial. As I always teach about symbiotic relationships, it might be helpful, but what happens is because of that person, I'm not, I'm not going to... That's the, that's the problem I have with stop and frisk. That's the problem. That what it does is it allows, and I, and I think it's a system that we need to look at, but the way it's going to be implemented will not work because people will judge you on your color, judge you on your accent, judge you on where you live, judge you on your hoodie. Right? So, so I have difficulty with that. We, we need to be careful that we don't include that kind of profiling, that kind of thinking, that kind of, uh, uh, of discriminatory uh, actions uh, later on that start in our mind. Why? Because in your mind is where everything starts in your mind, church. Your faith is actually built and destroyed in your mind. Uh, in, in your mind, you see a commercial and you see that wonderful car, and in your mind, you already see yourself driving it down the Pacific Coast Highway. <laughs> in your mind. In your mind, somebody tells you off, and you already, you know, not you, other people, you already thought destructive behaviors against them. Right? If you could read my mind, what an awful tale my, 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 my thoughts would tell. Right? We need to understand that everything creatively starts in our mind. Steve Jobs didn't do what he did by simply doing it. It was an idea in his mind. Okay? People don't reach the levels that they want to reach in, 
in their journey uh, simply because that's something good to accomplish. Oftentimes, it's in their mind. In fact, in sports, which is big for everybody except for me, the, the, the professional ball player trains themselves so that they can visualize in their mind the basket going in. Now, I don't play sports, and I visualize, and it still doesn't go in. Right? But professional players have gotten to a place of discipline. You know, Tiger Woods and all these guys, they make all that big bucks. But what they do in their mind, they already visualize. And t church, is true. What you visualize, you'll end up achieving. So if you're visualizing guilt, self-destruction, that's what you're going, I'm never going to be happy in life. You've just prophesied over yourself. We've got to get rid of this thinking, thinking. When we do that, we don't give anything that the enemy can use to make uh, negativity grow in our lives. Number two. Not only do we need to get him out of our mind, number two, we need to get him out of our language. <laughs> you could think that you want to give him a piece of your mind, but don't give him a piece of your mind. You might want to tell them off, thought it, but don't, don't do it. Proverbs 18, 21, look at what it says. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it, life or death through the tongue, will eat its fruit. You ever mess something up by something you said? Or is it just me? Church, if you want to be able to uh, help the enemy get to where he needs to get, you need to watch your mouth. I love talking to the children of our church. I love it. And parents, you need to be nervous when I'm talking to the kids by myself. Because anything the kid says, they, they just, they're, they're innocent. So they say, oh yeah, mommy punched pap, daddy out. My, mom, my father had a... My mother had a fight with my father last night. He didn't come home till 4 o'clock in the morning. And they went, how are you doing, my brother? My sister, oh, we're doing great. How's the matter? Everything is fine. Let me talk to Junior. Junior, no, don't talk to Junior. <laughs> there was an, uh, an analogy one time that if you really want to find out the, the character and quality of your walk with God, you have to take a, a, a they illustrated it this way, is that person that has a, a, a nail, they're going to drive through a piece of wood, they pick up the hammer, and if they miss the nail and get their hand, the first words that come out of their mouths, that usually tells you where they are when they walk with God. Huh? And I know psychologists would tell us the following. Psychologists tell you that when you use, you know, words that are offensive and stuff like that, that's really not important because all it is is an emotive reaction of something that doesn't really have a lot of weight. It's just you uh, transferring and, and kind of unloading this uh, emotive confusion and anger and emotion that you have for the moment, but it really doesn't mean anything. Sounds good. If you define it that way in your class, you'll get an A. But I'll ask any woman in here, because women are different than men. Did you know that? Yeah. Women are different than men. Did you know that? Yeah. Ask any woman in here if they still have etched in their hearts and in their psyche a word, an offensive word that was told by someone that they loved. They can not only remember it verbatim, they can feel the emotions. They can smell the air of what happened 15 years. Ladies, am I saying something that's true? Guys are different. We fight. My brothers, right? We fight. I have five brothers. We fight. And then after the fight is over, it's over. I mean, think about it in sports. Guys, when they, when they make the basket, make the home run, what do they do? They go and smack themselves in the butt. That's like some... I get bothered looking at it. Don't hit me like that, man. Right? Women, that's what... Women, they, they process what they say, thirty to 50,000 words a day. Amazing. Women's are, women are able to connect left and right lobes and they can communicate. Guys, don't even get into an argument with people, that, women that you love in your, in your life because you're going to lose. Lose. Right? Because what happens with us, because we don't process words that fast or that many, words don't stay embedded, generally speaking, inside of us. Come on, guys. You can say hallelujah. We're going to a retreat. Pretty soon we'll be able to process that when we go up to Mahanaim. Am I telling the truth, ladies? Right? You, the, women will look right away. It's, it, it's engrafted. It's etched in their, in their hearts and in their psyche. So we need to be careful with the words. Oh, baby, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to. You know me, I got angry. And, no, no, mature people control their mouth. People that are spiritually sound control their mouth. You get upset and everything, but you watch what you say because words have power. It, and this is very theological. Did not God said, let there be, and there was? Book of Genesis? God, the power of God, the Father, the Creator's Word. He, and isn't Jesus the Logos, the unspoken intelligence of God? Huh? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the, the book of John. So words have power. And we need to be careful, the words, and also the Bible tells us that out of the, out of the abundance of the heart uh, speaks the mouth. So we need to be careful, church, that in order for us to help the devil get there, 
is get them out of your mind, get them out of your language. Number three, we need to walk right. Walk in light. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, for you were once darkness. Notice, I like this because in the NIV it's rendered not that you were once in darkness, but he says once you were darkness. There was no demarcation line between being in darkness and being darkness. That's interesting, right? He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Church, let me admonish you today. Live right. Walk in truth. Walk in truth. Walk in integrity. Don't have hidden stuff. If you want the devil out of your family and out of your home, today when I finish this service today, we're going to do a special prayer, but when, when we finish, go home and get those things because, you know, we have a stash somewhere. I'm not talking about a stash of hash. <laughs> Listen, you got to let the past be the past. You love somebody 10, 15 years ago, get rid of that picture. You're loving somebody else now. Get rid of, oh, no, because I have a, she's not going to know. But, you know, whenever she doesn't treat me well or he doesn't treat me well or I have a problem with a relationship, I run back there and I, and I Google that. Oh, that picture. I remember when she used to hold me. <laughs> what are you doing, honey? Nothing, nothing. Walk in light. Give your loved ones a password to, to, your, to your... My wife has the passwords to everything. And she doesn't ask for it. I give it to her. Why? Nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. Right? We got to walk right. And that doesn't mean that you don't have a battle inside of distractions that can come your way. You will have battles. You will have distractions. You will have things that will pull you one way or another. But live in light. Don't live in darkness. Because at the end, the things that you do that are hidden will eventually come to light. You need to go home. Some of you, you know, we need to go and get rid of those, those games. It's just a video game. Nobody is. And I've seen some video games. They're not even worth the... You know, Sell it and give the money to the church. <laughs> Don't spend your time. In fact, the hour, it's true, guys now, and not only guys, gals, they spend hours. Hours on video games. If you spent half that time, you'd get a doctorate. If you spent half the time, you'd get your GED. If you spent half the time on relationship building, oh, come on, it got very quiet in here. <laughs> Live right. I'm not saying that's wrong. But, you know, we're within reason. Oftentimes we expend so much energy on things that are not fruitful to us or we're simply hiding the things that we should not be hiding. I believe that when you walk in truth, I don't walk around looking behind my back. What's going on? No, you live in truth. The hardest thing is to keep track with all the lies that you sometimes hear people say. Keep track with that. Tell me, are you married or not married? Do you live here? You don't live here. What's going on? Come I'm confused. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Walk right. Walking right is, is the easiest. Well, it's hard to do, but once you're there, you don't have to explain to anyone. You know, there's no hocus pocus. Who is that? I don't know who it was. It was somebody that just said hello to me. But it could be, who is that? And there was really more than what you're saying. Come on, I know, I know I'm speaking. I don't want to get more specific. We have visitors here today. On Wednesday, I'll be more specific. Huh? Go back there and walk, walk that your past might reflect light, that your present might reflect light, that your future might reflect light as well. For you were once children of darkness, but now you are the light. Live as children of light. Old Testament always has this, con this contrast of light and darkness, which you can read and study on your own. Number four. So get them out of your mind. Get them out of your language. Get, walk right. Live right. Number four. Use the weapons of the word. I love this. Hebrew. This is a, a key verse you might want to write down. Hebrew. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's writing now to these uh, Jews that had converted to the way, that had started to follow the way. And they, that was what it was called. Way, capital W. And they were also including in their... A religious, uh, uh, in their liturgy and practice, they were still uh, 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 putting in, in their practice of their faith, things of Judaism. So he's writing to them to bring correction. We don't know for sure who the writer is. Might have been Paul, but we're not sure. He's writing. He tells them the following. For the word of God is alive and active. Now, now church, let me just clarify. It isn't talking about this word because this word was not compiled yet. Okay? But it was talking about really references to the Torah. References to other extra-biblical writings, extra-biblical in the sense of the 66 books that are here, uh, other writings, he's saying, you need to be able to understand that the Word of God is alive and active. The other reference in Hebrews is also the word logos, alive and active, sharper than, and I can't unpack that anymore, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide the soul, the spirit, joints, and marrow. It judges the thoughts. Notice it's not people judging the thoughts. 
It is the word judging the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We need to use the weapon of the word. Now, let me just stop here for a moment real briefly because oftentimes we think the word is simply about knowing it. You could know the word and still not walk right. You could even preach the word and still not walk right. right? It's about becoming, it's about knowing, it's about proclaiming, but more importantly, it's about doing the word. And we need to get to a place where the, we use that weapon. Notice when, when Christ was tempted in the wilderness, the devil would say, for it is written, so that the, Satan actually knew the word as well, but Jesus went back and counted for it is also written, but he was living the word. So in order for you to neutralize the impacts of powers of darkness, you need to live right. Amen? I have no fear. I really, I honestly I can tell you that today. I have no fear of the powers of darkness. None whatsoever. Because I know greater is he who is with me than he that is in the world. Wait, in the world. And, I, and I know that God will protect and defend me. Now, when knowing the word, let me just get that for a moment. Because oftentimes we think we have to know nine verses. And I, I want to confess to you, sometimes my verses start in English and end up in Spanish. I think what God wants us to, do, to know is to know the meaning, the significance, the message, the theme of what is written in that book. Because NIV is just a translation. New King James Version, just a translation. If you use the Catholic Bible, just a translation. The Bible was not written in our common languages. The Bible was written in Hebrew, it was written in, in, uh, in Greek, and it was written in Aramaic. That's what it was written. So in order for you to really memorize the word, you'd have to go back and learn those languages, which I doubt many of us are going to do. But you want to get the gist, gist of the verses and the truth that emanates from, from that and then move forward and live that portion. Live it. There's no expectation that you know every... I don't know every single verse from the beginning to the end. I've read the Bible several times from, book, from cover to cover. I've read it in English and in Spanish. But I would never stand here and tell you that I've got it down packed. That's why when you call me and say, Pastor, where is the verse that says, I'll tell you, I don't know. Let's Google it. Thank God for Google. <laughs> right? So it's not knowing this many verses. It's living them in your, in your, in your life. Number five and, fifth and final observation, and then I want to call you up to pray. In order for me to send the devil there is get him out of my mind, get him out of my language, get him out of uh, walk right, use the weapon of the word. But number five, I need to have the mind of Christ. Note 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 2.16, under the inspiration of Apostle Paul, he says, Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct? And it's a question. Why is it a question? Because back then, there was that dilemma of, uh, of the mind of Christ. He was speaking to a Jewish audience, and also in this case, not only a Jewish audience, but a very pagan audience in the, in the city of Corinth. So he's writing that the debate back then was about the mind, the construct intellectually of who uh, of the Messiah was, the construct intellectually of was he the one or not the one. That's, those are the dilemmas. That were, that were going on. So he poses this question. He says, who has known the mind of the Lord? And then even using the term Lord, he's referencing to, in, in those listening, yes, Lord God, the creator, Father, but also Lord Christ, the Messiah that was promised. Who has known the mind? Also in the audience back then, the comprehension or deep understanding of the mind was critical. I remember that's when, uh, when, when you find Greek philosophers at play and teaching about the power of the mind and being able to uh, gnosis, to know, to be able to comprehend abstract and even blatant uh, theologies, and not theologies, philosophies of life, truth, the quest for truth. Let me leave it there. So he poses this question. Remember, Paul is an intellectual, a PhD of PhDs. So that's what he's driving for. How, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And then he kind of presents a paradox, and he says, but we, and in the term we, we of the way, we that have accepted Christ as the promised Messiah, we have the mind of Christ. So how can you and I have the mind of Christ in order to help the devil get to where he needs to be? The mind of Christ, I will never be able to describe it in two or three minutes that I have for this point, never be able to describe it, but let me just highlight a few. The, the mind of Christ is a mind of forgiveness. You have to get to a place where you forgive people, even people that are blatantly attacking you. That's hard to do. But study after study has shown that when you harbor, uh, if, you, if, you, if you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, that's going to burst out in psychosomatic illnesses, high blood pressure, and all sorts of things. Amen? The Cancer Centers of America, you need to go there and look at their website and, and, and study deeply or, or read the, the Forgiveness Project. When we have 
un, uh, when we have unforgiveness in our heart towards someone, and, and it might be legitimate. It might be legitimate. That's why I like when the, when the, the, the Pope, remember when he was in, in the square and that young man attempted to kill him. Remember that he was shot. One of the things that the Pope did, now the Pope is with, he's, he's no longer with us, but what the Pope did, he, it was important for him to go to that prison cell and forgive that young man. And oftentimes we don't move forward and the enemy has a picnic with us because we have not forgiven. And, we, and people that legitimately, there's no question that that guy pulled the trigger. But you've got to get to a place in your spiritual journey that you forgive people that have intentionally hurt you. Why? Because you're letting them live rent free in your mind. <laughs> They're fine, happy, go lucky, and here you are, all in anguish. You need to go back and release them. Now, that, that can be done through therapy, uh, through sp uh, spiritual intervention. Definitely it can be done. But we need to get to a place where we start unhooking those things from our mind. So Jesus' mind was one of, uh, of, of forgiveness. Christ's mind was a mind of, of uh, not only forgiveness, but of repentance. Right? We need to get to a place where we own up. Because, you know, when, how many perfect people do we have here? And if you think you're perfect, talk to me afterwards because you're living in fantasy. Right? None of us. We all have stuff that we're working with. But we have to come to the Lord in repentance. And repentance includes contrition where we, we realize that we've done wrong, we've offended. And what I love about God is that God is big on restoration. So the mind of Christ is not only that, but it's, only, it's also restoration. That he places you right back where you should have been in the first place. I love that. I love that. I love that about the Lord. That's the mind of Christ. It is one that forgives. It is one that restores. It is one that brings back. It is one that, that draws near. We need to make sure that we have that mind. We have to include that in our lives. When we do that, church, then we're telling Satan where to go and we're helping him get there. Why? Because when we have his mind, when we watch our language, when we walk right, when we have the weapons of the word, when we have the mind of Christ, in our, and not only in our minds, but we have the mind of Christ as our part of our temperament, what we're doing is building a hedge of protection around us. And the enemy will never be able to penetrate that, ever. He will try. But at the end, you will have victory in your journey. So today, tell Satan where to go. Help them get there. Get those negative influences out of your journey. Begin afresh this day. Get back on track with your life of living righteously and with integrity. And I promise you that you will be able to fulfill incredible things, accomplish incredible things in your life as you place God first there. Let us stand throughout the sanctuary.